Welcome back to the channel. Today, I am joined by Ken Lowry. Ken, welcome to the channel. Thank you, sir. Happy to be here. Thank you. I'm uh, I'm very excited to have this because I told Ken offline that I think he's a great listener and I love to listen myself. And the thing is about great listeners is that they're usually really interesting when they do speak. So I'd like to give you a lot of opportunity to do that today. And um, I'll start where I start usually with people that I interview for the first time. And that is that I'd like to know how you grew up. And of course, this is a very broad question. My fiance was like, you need to narrow that thing down. You know, you need to be more specific with that. So if there are specific moments that marked you, that made you who you are today, anything that you'll be willing to share, I'm very interested in hearing. Mm, yeah, well, thank you. I mean, first of all, I'm really happy to to be here and talk to you. Um, I, yeah, I really appreciate it, sort of, especially like this this posture of listening, like you said, I think you and I maybe share a lot of that. Like we we were both very curious and really interested to just like draw out more and, and like really understand mm. um and that for me is um yeah it's really important and i think maybe that's even where i'll start when it comes to my my early years there uh, i grew up in a big family so i'm i'm the sixth child of nine uh so yeah so i uh there was there was always a uh, more more content to fill the air than there was air to hold it right <laughs> um and yeah i i think there was um there was a point in my uh in my early teenage years where we we grew up very conservative christian like very very clear boundaries very hard boundaries just um those sorts of things and my siblings, I watched all my older siblings struggle against those boundaries. And there was all sorts of things continue to be difficulties between them and my parents for those reasons. And I had a really wise mentor in high school, which I, I owe an awful lot to. And he, I remember very clearly, like, it really finally landing for me that if you actually listen well, if you identify who a wise person is, and you listen to them, and you just try on what they give you, you don't have to like believe it really strongly, but just, just try it on, see how it goes, mm. that your life will probably go better. Yeah. And um, yeah, that that's like one of the things that I think is still just core for me is no matter where I go, um, whether it's in these spaces online or in my real life, I'm constantly looking for, Hey, where, who's someone that I can, that I can emulate in the room that I'm in? Who's someone mm. who seems to have some wisdom, some capacity to some felicity with life mm. that I can, that I can follow along with. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah I try to, I, I feel the same way, but then I think I hear Viveki in my back of my head being like, you should never do that with a live person. So I try to dissect the wisdom from the people and then, you know, <laughs> what is common among among the wise and then and then take that with me on that journey. And you've done that very clearly with um I would say I think John is is actually a really wise person. And just spending time with him, if you do it well, makes you makes you wiser in many ways. And I feel very similarly about um about Jordan, of course. And I spoke to actually to David on Thursday. It's also a very good experience. I'm, uh, I, I never know how these things are going to go because I don't know how these great thinkers are around just normal everyday people like myself, but I've been so impressed with the stature and the, the way of, of communicating the clarity. So, yeah. 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 There's that moment where like, when you meet especially when you meet somebody that you look up to right mm -hmm. there's that weird moment where you sort of don't know how it will go and if you can sink into the moment of just realizing that yeah we're just two people and then yeah and you you get a real connection that's man yeah yeah but i do think i do think that that point of making sure that it that you don't just sort of idolize one person mm. in in that ability to identify and follow like yeah you got to be able to recognize that it's it's the thing beyond the person that they're yes. pointing to yeah i think it's a natural tendency to follow the the one person i think it's the easy thing to do i think most people resort to that yeah. but i mean you're such a great listener that you make me speak already so i want to go back to your story now <laughs> because <laughs> 
I sense it. It's just the little, the little pauses, you know, and it's really good. You hold space very well. I think that's, uh, that's excellent. So you were in your teenage years, uh, sixth child of nine, you see your older siblings going up against the boundaries. Yeah. Why don't you continue on that? If there's anything relevant. <sighs> yeah. You know, well, it's, it's sort of an interesting thing because there's, um, it's difficult because there's my family of origin is going through a lot of really difficult things right now. Mm. Um, and so there's a lot of these things that are very alive and a lot of the, a lot of the narrative structures of really just surrounding my family of origin. There's just, there's a lot moving and shifting and, and, and things going on right now. So yeah. it's sort of, I think, hmm, that's why I'm, I'm struggling a little bit. Let me, let me, I would say, you know, so my, my native tongue is Christianity, but a very mm -hmm. sort of Protestant Anabaptist, um, fundamentalist Christianity. And so in many ways that's shaped the world that I live in and it's become the thing that I'm, that I wrestle against and continue to sort of, you know, break open frames that seemed so restrictive and so frustrating to me at different points, but also affording into reality and then finding myself dropping down into something, you know, the thing that breaks has broken a lot of the frames for me there. Like a, Buddhism has become pretty important to me. Mm. Um, Vedanta, obviously like uh, Neoplatonism. Mm. and so so i'll find i'll find these different moves to sort of break one of those frames and then what i'll find is i'll turn around and I'm like okay no this this was jesus the whole time just in a way that i didn't know huh. so i would characterize my 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 upbringing my childhood as a very the sort of protestant christianity that john diagnoses in awakening from the meaning crisis and then my journey since then has been trying to explore that and open it up and and use it sort of as a foil to to explore something new and finding that as I do that and challenge those frames that Jesus has actually been the guiding light that has kept me mm. that has kept me yeah yeah and you seem very secure in that which I find interesting to explore because I was just I told you offline and I was listening to your interview with uh, Zach Parson, who, by the way, I will give a little shout out to this because he edited this masterfully. Like he puts so many clips in there and the timestamps, which is really well done. It's something I can, uh, I can look up to, but um, yeah, I think you mentioned that since not to jump too far ahead, but but since COVID times, you haven't gone to church a lot, but you have felt a deepening of your of your faith. And I, I weirdly feel something very similar. I feel that even without having gone to church a lot in the last couple of years, it's 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 vastly deepened and it starts to make you wonder. Maybe this is this is this is where I'm supposed to be right now. Maybe this is the stage of of the life I'm supposed to be in. And I'm not sure what the question is here because I don't know it for myself. But where does that that come from that that foundation is secure despite what happens out there like i never feel my my faith i never feel that it someone shakes it up with anything anymore i used to be more vulnerable to that when i was like 15 or something but and i, I feel that might be similar for you yeah yeah totally i mean my like my faith is very far removed from institutions Mm. it's it's also it's sort of hmm, this is interesting like it's not exactly like it's um or at least i hope it's not just individualistic either though it's it's sort of beyond both in some sense because it's deeply i would say it, my faith in jesus especially it's deeply mystical in one sense because it's grounded in a lot of personal experience that many, a large amount of which is mystical, a large amount of which is just really, really practical. Like for me anymore, when there's 
when there's suffering in my life. And as I alluded to with my family of origin, there's been a lot of suffering recently. Um, like I, I have an icon, you know, an Orthodox icon of, of Jesus on the cross. And I have a, a small area in my home where every morning, this morning until we started, I, every morning I get up and I spend about an hour I, and I have a, a practice of uh, um, like, like John's ecology of practices. You know, I have a meditation practice and a, and a contemplation practice and a prayer oh. practice and these, and I, and especially when I'm suffering, I just sit there with this, with the icon of Christ on the cross. And um, it, it's become the place where my suffering can can rest a place mm. where my suffering can can move beyond myself such that i can so where a place where i can acknowledge like i can't carry this i can't carry it like I, and i but also i don't need to and i can let it go and so it's it's protestant in the sense my faith is protestant in the sense that it's it's outside of an institution and it is it is i think genuinely personal in my own but at the same time it's deeply grounded in the christian tradition right it's it's deeply grounded in figures like saint maximus and saint gregory of nisa and um and even uh you know like augustine and saint athanasius yeah. and all these people that i've read and so it's it's strange and i find myself continually moving and shifting with that like i would i would love to participate in something like the orthodox um liturgy i think but like i'll go and then i'll find that i can't really for some reason like something something like holds me askance yes but there's also so yeah so there yeah i'll stop i have there. the same i really have the same i have an orthodox church close here 10 minutes away and um a lot of it about it seemed to be so right and then i went multiple times and they even gave me like gifts and they i have constant contact with some of them and and somehow I, I felt something holding me back. And I'd like to also respond to what you said about it, your faith being outside of institution, but not completely personal. I experienced it exactly the same way, partially because I think that, of course, my faith has to go beyond institutions. Though I'm not opposed to institutions, but of course it goes beyond it because for some people it means reality, really. Um, and so it, it's an everyday lived experience. I do think that I may be naive that I don't go. <laughs> I don't know that yet. So I'm still starting to explore <laughs> that. Um, so I, I do listen, to, like I asked David, what do you think? How David Schindler, how can we fix the, the meaning crisis? What, what are we to do? Where are we supposed to go? And he said, it's a return to the church. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> take that. And, and, and then I listen to John and, I have all these these ideas living in my head, but I'm never sure for myself. And then I talked to about it to my fiance, and she's like, "You're already, you're already doing so much, you know. Why do you have to battle?" Like I talked to my family about it. Why do you have to battle so much with this church thing? You're you're doing great. And I'm like, "Yes, but but yeah. there's these guys, and they're so convinced that we have to return to the church. And why? Who am I to say that I don't have to? Am I exceptional? That's I don't know. I, I'm just putting this out there because it sounds a bit similar to what you're thinking about. No, so, yeah. I, I, I think you know one of the things that I notice in that. First of all, it, it's highly, re highly resonant, and second of all, I'm always struck by how difficult it is to put into words. Partly because it's confusing, and I don't really understand it myself. But partly also because it's. I mean, so I, I watched your video from a couple of years ago when you talked about your experience on ayahuasca. And for me, um, I've never done ayahuasca, but I've done psilocybin. And psilocybin's been really, was, was it really important for me? Not so much because of the content of the experience, but something about the way that you can have that experience of reality that, that's, that's, that you can't, that you realize that words become become frames that are smaller than your experience, yeah. right? Yeah. And and it's like that in talking about this issue with with the institutional church, where it's like it feels like the experience of God that I have and the faith that I experience is 
is somehow made smaller when I try to force it into the box of, of I go to this church yes. you know, and, and, and I identify with this and I'm not willing to do that. Like it, and, and, but I also don't know, I believe that it's possible for my faith to be bigger and deeper than the institution and to participate in the institution. Mm -hmm. I just don't know how to do that yet. Yeah. Yeah. I got you. Yeah, I have the same. I also have, in the, I have more stumbling blocks where I feel like my environment is not Christian at all. And so I also, similar to you, I grew up, well, I grew up Protestant. I'm not sure. I don't think you said you grew up Protestant or did you? Or is it like more yeah, fun? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we were like, we were like hyper Protestant. Okay. <laughs> yeah, for me, for me, it's the same. And I can't find home there. Definitely not. Yeah. I really tried and uh, I went to a Roman Catholic church close by here because I was like, I'm just going to stop church shopping. The funny thing is, Jonathan Peugeot says this, right? It's like this idea that we can that we can choose a church. Like, where does that even come from? But then he makes the switch himself. And I'm like, okay, it's interesting. <laughs> makes me kind of like, well, so then orthodoxy is interesting. And then with orthodoxy, it's a really big move. And I yeah. also think about the bridge aspect. For me, I, I really think of myself as a bridge. I see that in, in daily life. I... I care a lot about community and the people around me and I try to really connect with them. And I'm afraid that that, that might become more difficult the more I get nested inside of, inside of that. Um, so yeah, there's, there's these struggles. I, I want to make sure I don't ramble because this is where that often goes in my head. <laughs> these are my thoughts. These are my thoughts. Totally. I want to make sure about that. Totally. Totally. I will um, take us back a bit to your story, if there's anything else that it seems relevant about you for this conversation, particularly if something pops out in your mind that you're willing to share as well. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I think I, I probably don't talk about as much as I wish I did is my wife, mm. my wife, who I met in, in college, we met like first week of college well, and then we ended up, we were just friends for a couple of years. We dated other people actually. And, uh, and then it was our junior year. We studied, we studied abroad together down in New Zealand, mm. and that's where we started dating. We ended up getting married shortly after college, and it's not only not only am I not who I am without my wife. Like I don't I don't know how to separate the um, to whatever degree I I have any like. Uh, ability to show up in conversations or um, have philosophical import that's valuable like I I, I she's there in all of it right mm. so so my wife is my wife is someone who is just um I, I couldn't say I couldn't put into words highly how highly I think of her and how much um how important she is um in the whole journey for me that is absolutely wonderful. I feel the same way. I remember you tweeting something like um, that there is nothing. I'm not sure if you said beautiful, but then uh, dialogos with your with your wife. Yeah, and it yeah. really resonated yeah. with me. For me, I feel exactly the same way. Yeah, totally. She's always my my dream guest for the podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've tried. To, I've, I've done actually a couple episodes with my wife and um, they, they were good, but I'm... I, of course, it's again. It's sort of like trying to take a whole thing and fit it into a box, and it's just yeah. hard to do. And yeah, yeah. I think it's just a lived experience every day. I feel that for us, it's just going in and out of that all the time, and it's difficult to try to, like you say, put it into something. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, it happens organically. Like, yeah, yeah. But I always like. I want her to have more credit than 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 me in some sense for, for the good parts <laughs> whatever like whenever people say good things about me i'm like okay but like you should you should remember that a lot of it's due to my wife <laughs> yeah i feel the same way and then i take it <laughs> and i take it further i'm like you guys don't know what you say when you compliment me because it's i'm not me you know like there's so many influences <laughs> that, yeah yeah 
I don't own any of this. Like, yeah. There's this someone asked me that question recently. I was in an estuary, and it was an open question of how do I carry out um, my faith and how do I carry out this goodness without feeling like it's it's mine, without feeling that pride. I'm like, because it's not you. Like that's it's it's Christ. Like <laughs> you shouldn't take credit for. You sh- you don't have to feel pride for something that's not yours. So that's very helpful for me. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You work in a hospital, is that correct? Yeah. I can imagine that working in a hospital can be a very difficult job. Do you work night shift as well? I used to. I don't anymore. Okay. That's good. Because you're up very early right now. You said you also did a practice in the morning. Yeah, I get up at 4.30 every morning. Wow. That's my... Yeah, I mean, I didn't used to until my daughter was born um, uh, about a year ago. But when after my daughter was born, I, I realized pretty quickly that if I wanted to maintain ritual and um, and routine in my life, like that that was going to be my time that I could that I could carve out for myself that wasn't taking away from time that I could be with my family. So that's wonderful. Do you, what time? Is, huh? Four four thirty it is. Yeah, four thirty it is for sure. Do you know uh, Jocko Willink, by chance? Yeah, <laughs> he posts every yeah. day a picture of his watch that he's up at four thirty. It's uh, yeah, yep, it's a yep. Good inspiration. What time yeah. do you yeah. What time do you go to bed then? Usually it's about nine thirty. So okay. Usually, usually I get about seven hours of sleep. Yeah. Do you get a lot of meaning out of your out of your job? Yeah, yeah. So you brought up my job. So I work in um, so I work in cardiology. Um, my certification is a physician assistant, which if um, like it it is present in Europe, I think to some degree, but it's sort of like a, it's you do an abbreviated version of medical school, um, and then you practice sort of virtually the same as a doctor, but you'll have a lower level of a slightly lower level of responsibility. I still prescribe medicines. I still, um, you know, so for me, it depends a lot on what your relationship is with your supervising physicians or here in Oregon, we have what's called collaborative practice agreements because there's, there's some, you know, there's always sort of jockeying for power between physicians and physicians assistants. There's, there's some weird things happen there. I, I, I sort of stay out of that, but for all intents and purposes, I operate pretty much as a doctor. Um, especially in my practice with, uh, with the doctors I work with. And so, yeah, I, it's become, yeah, to start with this. I, death is something that has become for me a constant companion in this journey. Um, and that might sound odd to say, but you know, that idea that, all philosophy is preparation for death. Um, You know, for me, that's very, very real because a lot of what I understand of philosophy comes into play. Like the rubber really meets the road for me pretty frequently when I'm having conversations with people about their death, whether I'm telling them that now, now may be the time that they're, that they come to the end of their life or that they have had an event that will change their lives in ways that they can't expect and that they're not ready for um yeah like i i I see i see my job as being sort of like a shaman of those life transitions of that of the unaffordable unavoidable confrontation with the with finitude and um and so i i learn a lot i learn i learn a lot in that in that situation i learn a lot about how people respond i learn a lot about about grace and how to how to have those conversations and how to hold people how to how to pay attention to people in such a way that i can actually encourage them Mm. Um, there there's a way that those conversations can happen that is that is 
deeply sort of like sandpaper on your soul, really painful and difficult. Um, and there's a way that can be the most meaningful and life giving and beautiful experiences. Some of the most, some of the most profound and beautiful experiences I've ever had have been um, those conversations with people when they're when they're coming to the end of their life and helping them to come to come into confrontation with that fact yeah and 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 holding space for that and being with them there's a profoundly beautiful thing that can happen there but it's it's also you know it's a it's a sacred space when it's done well that requires an awful lot of I, I guess really the right thing is humility. Like if I don't know that I'm that humble of a person most of the time. And so I, that that's probably why the sandpaper happens sometimes, but, um, <laughs> but sometimes, sometimes, sometimes there's things that happen there that God shows up in a way that is just, yeah. So yeah, my job is deeply meaningful. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. And you speak of death. Do you think that, we can look at death as a good or a bad, bad thing. How do you view that finiteness that we have on life? It sort of, I, I, it sort of makes me think of a little, I, I, I tweeted something about, um, you know, I quoted Elon Musk's tweet about somebody tweeting from their knurling with, <laughs> without using their hands, right? And I had a little back and forth with someone and everybody's always trying to improve being human. Everybody's trying to fix things all the time. And I, I sort of think, can we just, what, what if we were just okay with being human? What, what if we were, what if we, what if we genuinely, not just accepted, but actually like affirm our finitude and the fact that this doesn't last forever and that, that we can have joy, maybe even because we die. Yeah. Um, so for me, yeah, I mean, I haven't come to face my own death yet, obviously, but I've been close a few times. And I, I find that I find that the more time I spend in the presence of death, the more grateful I am for it. And the more grateful I think we all should be for it. I think I think we become really, really dangerous. So there's something about us as humans that we become really dangerous when we think that we can avoid death. It's yeah, absolutely. very hubristic and foolish and death is this death is like a grace that's given us to keep us from ourselves yeah it makes sense because the people i speak to about living forever that they feel that's a good thing they often are not able to understand god as beyond the universe let's say so it's like, well, then at some point, someone's going to be God. <laughs> like, what are you even talking about? <laughs> it, I, yeah, I think that the experience of that, it solidifies this materialistic paradigm that doesn't afford transcendence. So in a way, that does do that for us. But it's such a bittersweet thing, you know, especially if it doesn't come at the right time, seemingly. If that's If that's a thing, at least that's how it feels to me. It's like the final humiliation, yeah. I think, right? Um, it's the final antidote to the sin of pride. Yeah. And um, yeah, so it's hard. I mean, I think and I, and you're so right, right? Like when there's when it comes too early, like I had a patient this week that I spent most of my time my time this week at work. The relatively young woman who. We don't really, at least when I left work day before yesterday, we don't know what's wrong with her, really. Like, we know a bunch of the things that are wrong with her, but we don't understand what's driving it. She's very, very sick, and she's got a 10-year-old and a 6-year-old. And so we're doing, you know, as best we can. But um, there's something profoundly sad and difficult. And, and it's like, man, those, those are times that's really, really hard to remember that somehow somehow it can still be good yeah i want to speak a bit about your role in this little corner 
because I think it's a uh, it's turning into a more and more significant and interesting role. Like I said, this, you seem to hold space very well for people, and I think hearing what your job is about, I understand why <laughs> um, you've become so good at this. What do you think your role is, if you had to describe it for yourself? And maybe that's difficult to to step out of that. And where do you think all of this is going for you personally and this this little corner in general? That's a good question. I, I, I feel like my first reaction is, I don't know. <laughs> um, as far as my role, I feel... Mostly, I feel so honored to be even a part of these conversations um, that that I find that whatever is fostered by my my participation in them, it's not planned. It's not formulated. I don't you know what I mean? it's it it's not I don't know. I just show up and I hope to learn things mm. and and so, you know, I've I have struggled with that some, like especially, and I'm sure you're you're familiar with this, right? Like you, you get some people who are excited about what you're doing, you get some some more views, some more you can talk to all of a sudden you can talk to people who you couldn't dream of having talked to before. Mm -hmm. And then like, you know, at, at at one point last summer, I think I got sort of inflated with that. Partly that, partly some other things that were going on. And then that was like, no, okay, this doesn't this is not this does not feel good. And then I had a big crash after that where I just wanted to abandon the whole thing entirely. And then, um, and now it's something much more, I don't, I don't know what it is. I just sort of leave it. I sort of leave it. And I just, when there's something that comes to me, you know, when, I, when I'm excited about something, and there's an idea that relates to a, a person that I feel like, oh, that would be, that would be a great person to talk to about this. This would be exciting to explore with them. And then I just reach out to them and do, and that's how the things, um, how my conversations generally show up or somebody reaches out to me like you did and I'm yeah. happy to talk to anyone. Um, but also I don't know where this whole thing is going. I, I think um, the thing that concerns me is when I hear people trying to, trying to direct it on purpose. Yes. You know, like I think, I think we're all responding to something that is, I think John has talked about it as a, um, Oh, I forget which word he uses exactly, but something like a, a a new discovery, a new revelation of the sacred. And and I think that's I think that's right. I think there's a new a new incursion of the sacred into our reality at this kairos of the meaning crisis, and that we're all trying to participate in that in some way. And that as long as we don't try to scale it, good things will happen. But I don't know what they will be. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, also, I think about John being like, I'm happy my channel is the size it is and I don't want it to be bigger. I think there's a lot of wisdom in that idea. And I think similar with this community. What what I like about your answer is that you approach both your own role and this little corner the same way you approach your conversations. You you let You let the logos lead it, let's say. And I think there's a danger to directing it because then you take the place of God. It's a pretty, pretty <laughs> dangerous game to play. Let's say. Totally. That's good. And, and, and there's ways in which I, I don't know. I'm, I sometimes feel insecure about that because I probably don't plan things as much as maybe I should. <laughs> like there's, there's a, there's a tone off to be held there, right? Like you should, you should plan things, but I, so I've gotten a little bit better at that, you know, actually writing down some questions because early on I, I, I would have like one thing to talk about and I wouldn't, plan anything from there and sometimes that got me in a little bit of trouble especially um especially in a couple of conversations where i didn't find myself you know sometimes you can just drop into it with people yeah and other times there's more of a of a barrier and you have to be a little more i don't know yeah it, you you really can't predict it usually like i really have yeah, the same thing so, sometimes i even make questions and i don't use them at all because it just you know it just flows and other times, uh, you better be prepared. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm. Exactly. And those are the ones that tend to be the the best and definitely the most enjoyable are when you just let the logos lead. Yeah. 
Let the Logos lead us, indeed. I'm going to do my brother some justice. My brother's name is Aaron, by the way. He told me your your brother's name is Aaron, too. That's right. That's right. We, we got another parallel there. Older older brother? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> uh, is your brother older as well? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're a family of six, actually. So that's also kind of like, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. That's yeah. Awesome. Uh, it's a bit of a longer question, so if you have the patience, uh, totally good. Because I so I Facetimed him an hour ago, hour and a half. Like I'm talking to Ken Lowry. Do you have any questions? And uh, he just sends me this like <laughs> essay. Yeah. He's he's a very <laughs> um, diligent guy, I would say, and I really like his questions. I'll start with a shorter one. Actually, I thought it was quite poetic. Would you say that? While you are climbing Mount Sophia, you are carrying a cross. And what awaits us at the summit of Mount Sophia? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, man. Um, just a bit of background. Ken's channel is called Climbing Mount Sophia. So, you know, so people know where the question comes from. Yeah. Yeah. I experience myself as always carrying a cross. Um, I find that in moments that I would tend, I'm really hesitant about the 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 peak of Mount Sophia because every time I feel like I've gotten there, um, it you know it feels like you sort of brush over the top and then you're sucked back out of it. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Sort of. Um, and you can never, of course, characterize what the top is exactly, but you can certainly see it. Um, but I find that there are the, the times where it feels like the peak comes into view are times where the relation to the cross shifts. And it's no longer exactly me carrying it and in some ways it's it's carrying me um with all that is implied in that mm. the cross carries you yeah i think that's i think that's i there's a lot behind that and it's poetic because i think it has to be but yeah do you want to leave that implicit or you want to expand on it because sometimes like you say with um the experiences you have maybe you don't want to box them in somewhere so if you want to leave that implicit that's fair but i'm very interested yeah, let's keep going and if yeah let's leave it implicit for now maybe more of it will come out yeah okay that's good Okay, let me see what's interesting. So this is the longer question. I'm Lucas's brother, and I find myself in a similar position to you, where I want to take the Christian religion very seriously, but also I found it difficult to go to church. So this goes back to what we spoke about before. Paul van der Klaai has described it as many folks expressing the sentiment, can't live with it, can't live without it. <laughs> do you agree with that statement and how do you navigate this and more personally i try to check my ego in matters such as this one that is to say am i not putting off going to church simply because i consider myself too good for it am i not too much in a consumerist mindset that i want a church to answer to my needs and isn't humility and therefore participation precisely the answer to such a conundrum i often fear being a fence sitter Compare the either-or stage in Kierkegaard before the religious sphere, the last man in Nietzsche, etc. Those are the thoughts I have personally. Do you have those too? And if so, how do you deal with those? Yeah. It's okay, it. yeah. I mean, <laughs> I... Um... Oh, man. Yeah, that's really good. I don't know that I have an answer for any of that, although except to say I'm right there with you. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, the either or, the either or in the last man, the abyss, all of it. I mean, one of the things I found is um, you said something toward the beginning of the conversation where you talked about having the faith to believe that you are where you're supposed to be. 
because I think one of the things that those of us who are in this position are trying to hold, like we're trying to hold impossible paradoxes. It's an impossible paradox to be more Christian than Christianity. And that's sort of what we're what we're doing. Because I think we're acknowledging that we are, it's not our own in some sense, right? We all live within these patterns that are that are far beyond us. And the pattern of splintering within the Christian church. You know, I find myself way out somewhere in, in the vast reaches of space, far, far from the original star of Christianity in the sense of the institutional church. And it's like I woke up there, you know, I was born into it. And, mm. and it and I was born into a, a a version of that Christianity that was deeply conflicted, deeply uh, hubristic. I mean, you know, I I went through, I think, three church splits um, as as a child and and teenager, and you know that that's every time that happened, it was some version of well, we know better what God wants, and so we're going to start our own church now. And, and so that's where we find ourselves. And I think we're trying to be true. I think we're trying to be true. We're trying to be faithful to something, which is whatever it is that caused all those splinters, whatever it is that, whatever it is about being in an institution and, and having an institution try to point us to God and the propensity of institutions to become idols instead of symbols. And that like, I think we're trying to be faithful to that while still like while still being humble enough to acknowledge that we actually don't know, right? That like the heart of that question is is a deep humility. Yeah. If, I'm, if I'm hearing your brother right. Mm. It's, it's a deep humility of like, man, there's something really here. And it's really good. It's really deep. And like Jesus is jesus right like jesus the christ and there is something about this church but there's also the, the church held held sway in the world that we live in we live in a world that at one point the church owned in some sense and now now it's fragmented all over the place and so in some sense that's i don't whether right or wrong it's what comes up for me in response to some of those answers of like we'll go to church it's like i see what you're saying and i would like to but also there there's some reason that we all did go to church and then we ended up here yeah. and so so i think it's it's that for me where i land where i land in my daily life is to is to have the faith to find the faith really not as a function of uh, hold on what is it i don't know if faith is the right word it's, it's sort of right but i don't know um it's like finding the capacity to just sit with that paradox and to just live it and not know yeah I think you my brother myself the fact that we're thinking about this question so much and wrestling with it to me it's already a good sign not to say that I'm there or I ever get there at the right spot but I, I never want to stop thinking about it and thinking through it and I think it's good that some people are certain and they're happy where they're supposed to be. But I believe there's a reason that we're at the spot that we are at. And we must explore that as deeply as possible. Yeah, you know, you know, Matthew Pajot's, um, you know, his work. Yeah. The, the idea of the margins, right? Like, I feel as if, like I said, I've, I, woke up i was born i find myself in in inescapably in the margins but it's not exactly inescapable because i could just jump back to the center 
Mm-hmm. I could just go join the Orthodox Church and just put put my head down and upload all that framework. But I'm more interested in being a knight of faith. And it's not that I don't think you can be a knight of faith in the Orthodox Church by any means. But I don't know that I can be, at least yeah. not yet. Yeah. Yeah, I feel the same way. And I feel for me, if I would go right now, it wouldn't be right. I don't know if it would be for the right reasons, let's say. It would be more for of like, I'm afraid that if I don't do this, there's a, I don't know, there's a hubris or there's there's this or that. And I've never made a good decision in that way. Never. My best decisions have always made a lot of sense to me. Where it is like, it's largely implicit. For example, the choice of, of my partner. Um, but there's such a deep conviction and there's such a deep clarity. It's like, oh yes, of course. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So I will continue yeah. to work toward that, I guess. Right. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. If you think like if I I that if you're doing it out of fear, right? Or just to surrender to something. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel that. Okay. And you are a father. How does that change yeah. you becoming a father? Oh man, it's it's well so hard but so good <laughs> um i think you know part of sometimes i wish i didn't take everything so seriously you know yeah <laughs> but like uh i find myself incapable of of not just taking taking my own life and 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 the life as, as it unfolds around me very very seriously and so i yeah, becoming a father has remade me. It's it's remade almost everything about me. Um, because I think I've tried really, really sincerely to shift shift my relevance realization off of myself. Um, and I've been so richly rewarded. My daughter is just wonderful, like just incredible. And also, it's become such a wonderful anchor when when I'm suffering or when it really feels like uh when it really feels like climbing Mount Sophia is a is carrying a cross you know sometimes that, that cross is really heavy and coming like there's this uh David Schindler told me this is a quote from Eric Pearl who was his uh who was his graduate advisor and one of the great Neoplatonists that the most philosophical thing you'll ever do in your life is change your baby's diaper. And um, I love that. And I think about it all the time. Every time I change, I change my daughter's diaper. I, I think about that. And I, and I think about, you know, it's, it's become, it's become a ritual for me of seeing my daughter as Christ and, and seeing this act of, of serving her and, and changing her diaper and you know, wiping the poop off, right? Like seeing that as being um as being a, a symbol, really, like a genuine symbol. Um that it's there's something so practical and so mundane and so real. Like it like you can't deny the reality of that. And mm-hmm. so whenever everything else is going on and I'm wrestling with christianity and holding this giant paradox of being a christian um and i can change your diaper <laughs> that's great it sounds like a grounding practice as well yeah oh yeah brings you straight down to earth yes yes that's good it makes me remember really quickly that i'm not that big of a deal which is mm. a really reassuring thing to remember <laughs> it certainly is I want to speak a bit about flow. It's something that Viveki speaks a lot about. When do you experience flow in your life? Um, one of the most now is uh, playing jiu-jitsu. Mm. Um, so I started playing jiu-jitsu about uh, nine months ago now. And I really love that. It's one of the best. 
Oh man, it's been so helpful. Yeah. Is Brazilian? Yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah. Do you do you I've been uh, really thinking about doing it. I'm I'm very active myself, so I'm already I'm moving every day. I've I've like lifting weights I've done for seven, eight years consistently, and I play football twice a week. I'm, I I really don't want to get injured by things. That's the only thing I'm thinking about with jujitsu because there is a there's definitely a danger there. But I'm extremely attracted by it for the physical and the mental. Every aspect of it basically speaks to me. Um, so my friends are interested in it, so it's definitely calling me. But um, but I'm not quite there yet. I think it's similar with the church. I think it comes at the right time. It will come to me at the right time when I need it most. Totally. What has it taught you? Yeah. Well, much like yourself, I mean, I, I, I've lifted, I've been lifting for well, off and on since, since early high school, but, mm. but really, you know, consistently every day for the last five, six years. And at some point I sort of like, I, I hit a peak with that. Like I, I, I did some really heavy stuff doing some power lifting and I hit you know, like 1100 pounds on the big three of uh, bench squat and deadlift. And what do you mean? What, you, got, what was your bench? My bench was 255. <laughs> and then I squatted, I squatted like 405 and then I deadlifted, uh -huh. I don't know, 560 or something enough to get to 1100 across the three. Yeah, the squat sounds dangerous. The sounds sounds terrifying. <laughs> yeah, it, or it, you know, it's actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was fun, but then it was yeah. like, well, where do I go from here? Yeah, exactly. You know, um, and you know, my back started hurting, and so so I needed to find something new. But jujitsu, what are the what are, taught me so much. I mean, one of the big things is the sense of needing to maintain contact like there's there's a mapping thing in jujitsu the sort of the sort of niche construction idea that john talks about in jujitsu that's a real lived experience you have to like you have to really be very hypersensitive to the space being made available being afforded to you by your opponent and then you have to have within within yourself the capacity to fit yourself to that space both in terms of defensively and offensively and really dynamically evolve constantly with it yeah. and so doing that for an hour you know it completely takes over your your experience yeah you can't think about anything else while you're doing yeah. it or you will get choked. Like <laughs> there's a, there's a very clear feedback. It's very real. It's very embodied. Um, but I find it transfers, it transfers to everything in my life. That's amazing. Does it, does it involve play? You think definitely? Yeah. Huh? yeah. Oh, very much. Yeah. Yeah. Because I can imagine if you're in, in a situation like that, because it's so intense and you're like, well, basically fighting someone. I've never done it myself. I've never been in a, in a real fight. Of, of, are you really in like a fight or flight type of thing? Or you're able to zoom out a little bit and try to, yeah, I guess flow. Or maybe they go hand in hand. I'm actually not sure. I'm always interested in that. Especially yeah. like professional fighters, you know, because they're, they're about to be knocked out potentially. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely not on that level. You know, I'm doing it at a at a at a, you know a, a local gym. Mm -hmm. I've got a. I'm I'm fortunate to be at a place with really really, the main guy who coaches most of the time when I'm there is just a fantastic. He's a great coach and he's also yeah. a fantastic person. He's a professional fighter, and and he's he's done a bunch of professional fights. So, so he can give me a lot of insight from that side. But in my in my experience, you know, mostly you're you're with guys who. You know, you talk to them before you start, and then you spend a lot of the class, you know, drilling specific moves. So you're all sort of learning together. And then at the end of class, you know, generally you're, you'll do one, two, maybe three, five minute rolls where you're actually, you know, you're really going 
probably not full bore, but pretty close. I mean, you're 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 really trying to to beat each other. But but so there's a sense of that idea that you're 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 cooperating more than you're competing, like your competition yeah. is on top of a deeper cooperation is very real for me. Yeah. I don't know that I've I haven't been in a in a in a real fight. I don't know if I've ever been in a real fight, but you know, not since not since high school when I when I was really, you know, like testosterone hate me. Yes. Wanting to hurt the other person. Yeah, I recognize that. Okay. <laughs> what is your favorite well, I'll, I'll expand it a bit. Favorite movie or book, and the Bible. The Bible in no way counts. So, any anything <laughs> related to that? Because I'm just curious if there's a specific story that is that is more recently made that really speaks to you. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, the first thing that comes up is there's a book called Mount Analog by Rene Dumal, and okay. that's sort of that's that was one of the big inspirations for climbing Mount Sophia. Mm. Um, and it's, it's, I, part of why I bring that up is because it's lesser known. Part of it is I'll, if it is a story and I think that's a little bit more of, of your question is like yeah. a story. Yeah. Um, but also partly because I don't understand it and it's sort of a strange book because the author, the author died, you know, like he, he, you very much get the sense that he's only written about one third of the book. Like he's just started to get you going on it. Um, and then he, he, he dies. And so he, he doesn't get the book, doesn't get to finish it. But there's some, there's some, at the end of the book, there's an epilogue where, you know, his wife put in the, the notes that he had written. And so you get, like, you get that ability. There's something about doing all of this stuff that if you can get the ability to sort of like hear through the words of what the, what someone, especially if there's a, if they're a philosopher is trying to convey that that book helped me with a lot. So okay. that's one. And there's another, yeah, yeah. And then there's another one called, uh, and there was light, uh, yeah. by Jacques Lucerian, um, it, which is a story of a guy who, um, who grew up in Paris just shortly before world war two. And he, he lost his eyesight through an accident when he was about eight years old. And then he developed the capacity to sort of synesthetically, um live in a in the world as if he could see mm. um and that was really helpful for me um partly to develop like for me my the way i think is very sort of synesthetic i i ideas coalesce into sort of shapes and patterns and visuals and you know there's all that stuff happening and so those two books were probably some of the most important at developing that it's very interesting what you said last. Uh, can you expand on that a bit? Because the, the analogy is with the man who lost his eyesight and he starts to kind of mimic eyesight by combining his other senses, I guess. That is what you're saying. How does that apply to, to your understanding of ideas and, and patterns? Trying to, I'm trying to grasp it. Well, it's sort of what I mean with the climbing Mount Sophia. Like for me, Mount Sophia and... Like it's more than a metaphor and it's more than an analogy. It's a it's easier to explain to people if they understand the psychedelic space. Mm -hmm. You know, because one of the things that I think psychedelics do is they they sort of change the angle of your consciousness on yeah. reality. And you can you realize that when you close your eyes and if you're if you're careful and you listen, you can start to you can start to see and interact with with patterns of reality in in a new way from a new angle. And for me, I find that on the borders on the borders between senses, right? So so part of my practice is in, in the morning is I'll tune in to each sense individually, right? So hearing, taste, smell, touch, sight. And then I'll try to play with the borders between them because there's a felt sense in the borders between them. And 
there's a way that you can overlay ideas onto that, right? So have you done the the dialectic into the logos? No. With John yet? I highly recommend um highly recommend that because <clears throat> one of the things that 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 has helped me with a lot is to you know in in that that's a practice of pursuing virtue right so you 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 take a virtue and you're you're trying to to learn from it and about it and one of the things that you do is that it's, say you take courage you try to get a taste of what courage is you try to get the smell of what courage is you try to get the the sound of what you know and so you and so i've done that now with every virtue that I can think of and done it in the dialectic practice and do it by myself. And so I've started to get that sensibility of, you know, there is, there is, there is a felt sense of each of these ideas. There's a felt sense of what it's, what is it like? Um, what is it like to, well, to be courageous or, or to any of those things. And like, yeah. so for me, those things come on board and then they, they sort of coalesce into a, into a, sometimes it's a visual, sometimes it's more of like a sound, but I can sort of interact with them in a, in a sort of, it's an imaginal space. Um, but they all can, they all lay themselves out for me and they all coalesce into a, into a greater structure. And that's sort of what Mount Sophia is. Oh, well, that's very well explained. I like it a lot. I like the image that creates in my head. Would you then say that the blind man who stops, who, who can't see anymore, in terms of ideas and, and using it and applying it to your example, are we ever able to see with our eyes? Do you understand what I'm asking? I don't know if I do. Say it another way. Okay, so the the book that you mentioned, it's about a yeah. man who lost his eyesight, and then he has to say synesthetically see again. Is there any way for us to not see synesthetically, but to actually see the way he used to see with his eyes? In other words, perhaps being human beings and the human experience is losing a deeper understanding, and and then working with what we have to get closer to. When well, you mentioned the virtues, but deeper reality itself must we must we enter upon death to to see again in that sense what what do you think about that that's a good question if i'm understanding it correctly let me, <laughs> let me try to state it let me try to state it but state back to you what i'm hearing you ask and if i guess the easiest way is to think of it for me what it brings up is a little bit like uh like Plato's notion of, of the cave and like can we can we truly live in the sun yeah in the light of it out, um is that yeah, right that's very good I, I was I made I immediately jumped to Plato when you mentioned uh this example it yeah absolutely yeah well there's a thing there I've thought different things about this at different times but where I'm at with it right now is that there's There's a way in which if we if we just try to do that, we lose all the like if we just try to do the like see and live in the the essence of all the things, we lose the particularity. Mm. You know? And there's a way, but there is a way to, it, it's like, it's like, a, it's like seeing at the right angle. There's a way that if you can see, see things at the right angle, they always take you right back to the essence. Yeah. And the appearance, the particular situation that you're in. And I think this is the notion of the symbol, right? Mm -hmm. And and this is, goes back to what I was talking about with my, with changing my daughter's diaper, right? Yeah. Like that every time I get to change her, her diaper, it's a different thing. Right? Yeah. It's a different moment. It's a different experience. She's different. Sometimes 
like she she she's doing this thing right now she's 17 months old and she's doing this thing where like uh she's gotten excited about uh going pee on the potty so so she'll tell us when she needs to go and we'll take her in there and she's usually already gone in her diaper but we, we praise her anyway and hey good job remembering noticing that you needed to be and, and then you know she'll go and she'll grab it and she'll grab a new diaper for herself out of her drawer she'll bring it to us and she'll lay down on the floor and she'll say good girl good girl because we're tell her she's a good girl and she does that. and um and it's like man sometimes it's like that right and it's so beautiful and she's just she wants to help she's participating and sometimes she's just fighting you she's screaming you, whatever each one of those is different but when i i find that when i move myself when i move myself to the proper angle i can participate the humility the service the like all the virtues that are entailed in doing that simple act and it can take me through it can take me into the way in which it's an opportunity to to truly bring good into the world mm -hmm. you know to truly shine the light of the good um and that I can participate that essence. So I guess my answer to your question is yes, I do think it's possible, but I think it's possible insofar as we genuinely, truly and deeply find joy in the most mundane, the suffering, the simple, um, the average things in life. I agree with you. I do. First time I heard that idea of you should go back into the cave as well. It's like, it's like, oh, and then I started to practice it. I'm like, oh, oh, I get it. It makes so much sense. Like I'm, a, I'm a human being for a reason, you know. I, I don't want to do the spiritual bypassing. Yeah. And um, yeah. Okay, that's a great answer. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and that 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 idea there that. I learned this just recently. I started listening to the Lord of Spirits podcast. Mm -hmm. um, and that idea that Satan fell because he's envious of humans, not because he's envious of God, is, I think, a really good one. Yeah. And... Can, you, can you expand a bit? Because I haven't listened to that. Um, well, they're they're making the case that that's what scripture says, is that... That it's because Satan's envious of humans that he that he that he falls, and that humans have a capacity. Like, what it means to be human is that you are given the opportunity to infinitely move into the character of God, and to become infinitely more like God, and that therefore, and that that's precisely why being finite is to being fine being finite and 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 being mortal why it's such a gift is that you, you actually have the opportunity to explore infinitely yeah um into the depths of god into the depths of being into the depths of goodness and and to even go back to our the earlier conversation about death it's like that's why that's such a gift that's why it's so valuable is every every time there's something that that seems out of place and mundane and well okay let me let me throw this in here because this was a thought i had last night that there's a trinity to intelligibility, right? John talks about intelligibility a lot. And there's genuine similarity, genuine difference, and genuine surprise. And the genuine surprise part is where, like, when we notice incongruent incongruities, where we expected to find something, it's an opportunity to open to newness, to open to moreness. And that's that's the gift of being finite, I think. Mm. That's a wonderful answer. I really like it. I want to ask a bit about John, actually. You've spoken to John multiple times. And um, I think you've started to develop a connection. And 
You don't actually have to answer this question if you don't have to. I can edit it out. But I'm always wondering about John, about what is the best path for him. And I want that because to me, he's like, in terms of the people I've spoken to on and offline, he's one of the most present individuals I've ever met when you speak to him. And a lot of people in this little corner are turning toward Christianity or the legacy religions in general. Jordan all recently as well. And I know you've spoken to him about this and John has spoken to him about this. What do you foresee for John or what would you want for John? And maybe that's not a specific path at all. The way we spoke about the church, maybe that's, that's something whole else, but have you been thinking about this and all? And if you have, what are your thoughts about this for John? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, John's one of the most important figures in my life. Um, I'm really grateful to have, you know, I, I, I don't spend a lot of time with him because he's a very busy person, but to have actually developed a friendship with him, though, um, and have some access to, to speak with him on and off camera. Um, and... Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, obviously he's unbelievably brilliant and he, but I think he's doing this, maybe the best way to say it is in that same way that I talked about waking up far, far from the center of Christianity. I feel like that's a part of the deep love that I share with John, that I have for John, is that I see him, you know, moving the whole world to to process that disconnection that alienation that domicile that he found himself in if you, you know if you know his personal story mm -hmm. you know that that his 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 upbringing his origin was it was was very much like that yeah and so you know i don't i don't know where it where it lands him in this life you know i uh, i think i think john is one of the most one of the most thorough followers of the way um if not the most that i've ever that i've ever seen or known um and i think he carries his cross mm, that he does for sure thank you for that you mentioned that you had some influence of vedanta and buddhism yeah and neoplatonism how do you view, maybe not all three at the same time, but how do you view that they differ from Christianity? Maybe let's start with Vedanta specifically. Do you feel like that's a completely different binding to God or relationship to God than you see in Christianity? Or do you view them more as two different paths leading to the same thing? I think of them as... Uh... I feel like for me, Vedanta looks like the the best attempt to build that that metaphysical structure, sort of similar to Christianity, without having like the actual revelation of God um, in the person of Jesus Christ, and so. I don't know. I don't. I don't see them as competing, but I also don't see them as the same. You know. Yeah. I think, I, like, I find it. For me, everything everything comes to comes to Jesus. But. I think Vedanta is really darn good. If you don't, <laughs> if you don't have it, like, if you don't know about Jesus, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. I I guess that'd be my take, but I don't think. In some sense, there's nowhere else to go, right? Like people, when they talk about, I think a lot of people misunderstand the legacy religions, especially because they think that they're actually going in different directions. And, you know, maybe, and they do in some sense, but there's only one place to go.
Yeah, from the one the many emerge. Yeah. To the one the many will return. Yeah. That and makes Buddhism, sense. Buddhism, like for me, Buddhism is like Buddhism has been so tremendously helpful on fine grained discipline. Uh, and the phenomenological opening up to to God and reality. You know, I don't see Buddhism and Christianity. I mean, there's strains of Buddhism that that um, have more metaphysics in them and things like that. But I, but I, I'm much more when I talk about Buddhism, I'm thinking more in the Zen type tradition. And Thomas Merton, Thomas Merton, and his um, his dialogues with D.T. Suzuki, um, and uh, religion and nothingness. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's one of my core, one of the deeper looks at Buddhism that I would have. Um, to me, it doesn't, it not only does it not stand in competition with Christianity, I think it's just talking about something different. It, like, I think, I think Buddhism is talking about the phenomenology of an individual finite creature and, and learning how to actually fit into that properly. And it doesn't really have anything to say about the sorts of things that Christianity is trying to talk about. Yeah. And then neo Neoplatonism, how do you relate to that? And do you think you can be a Neoplatonist and a Christian at the same time? Yeah, I mean, I, I for me, I don't know, I don't know how you it would be really hard for me to actually fully to fully separate the two. Uh like because for me, you know, like Saint Maximus the Confessor is probably the you know, it's him and and Dionysius are the are the some of the greatest thinkers in Christianity. Their their version, their vision of Christ and Christianity and the and the cosmos is the one that I find compelling, and they're deeply Neoplatonic. And so, of course, you know, I'm sure there's 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 ways to fully separate them, but for me, they bleed together so much that that. Um, I think Neoplatonism, you know, John's idea of the Silk Road and Neoplatonism giving the sort of courtyard for all these things to play together is really important. But I think that Neoplatonism is maybe the something like the best language to to open up the capacity to interact with with all of them and and thus through all of them to see Christ. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm very attached to Plato for some for some reason. When I was younger, I was interested in um, Atlantis and um, people pointing to like historical, you know, ideas about Atlantis. And then I was just like, I don't know, 17, 18, reading that passage from Plato. My dad has this crazy library because he's a theologian. And uh, I just read a little bit and I was like, this is, this is so brilliant. <laughs> like, I stopped caring about that little passage and I just went to read to read everything and uh it's just such a revelation to me that well it was just so cool to me that there was someone living that long ago that had this caliber of ideas thinking about things that a lot of my peers wouldn't even think to think about and doing it in such a brilliant and thorough way open for me it opened up like a complete road to the ancients where i could really like see what wisdom there was hidden in there and i was wondering what your relationship is to to Plato and Plato's work when you first came into contact with that and, and how that how that was for you so oh yeah no I totally agree with you like there you know you you sort of you sort of pick up that that idea that just because we're we're later in time we're somehow better yeah it's a very natural western thing to do I feel like <laughs> to think about time as linear and to think of us as the most evolved creatures yeah yeah, and then I think I had this uh, similar, very similar experience. We realized, like, oh, wait a second, like we're actually, you know, they they really had something going on back then that we, a lot of us don't certainly don't have. Oh. Maybe none of us have had. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's possible. But yeah, I I have a tremendous admiration for Plato. You know, for me, I don't think um, Plato was very. I found it often dry until I read um, Schindler's 
Plato's critique of empty reason. And I think that was mostly because like it was it was sort of academic for me before. It was something that you had to do. Yeah. And so then it was like, ah, no. And and then after 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 that, it all just opened up like, you know, John and David opened up Plato for me. And now now Plato every time I read it, it's like, well, there's so much that I learn every time. It's yeah. a surprise. Yeah. Yeah, I must say David's book is excellent. Um, I discussed some of it with him this week and um, it did a similar thing for me where I first read The Republic and I was just, I, I, was, I was reading it in such a literal manner. It's, it's just embarrassing to be honest. And then I read David's book and I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of missed the whole thing. But, uh, yeah, sure. Why I'm not? so glad you got to talk to David. Yeah, he's, he's a just... really a wonderful mind. I, Well, more than that, I really appreciate when people of this caliber, people people that think through ideas this big are actually so sincere and so kind and so thoughtful. And I really saw that in him. He was completely engaged. And, you know, I told him as well, you don't have to give me this time. Like, I'm just someone asking you to talk to, to talk about Christ and Plato for an hour. And, um, yeah, he did and super gracious about it and yeah yeah wonderful oh yeah yeah he's just a joy yeah how did you how did you get into contact with with david was it through john or no i um i just i i did some research because i was reading his book and just like i mean i mean reading there were there were there's I've, I've talked to david a bunch of times now on my channel and and in in some of the conversations we talk about this but like there were times that reading especially that book was just it was a mystical experience for me like it yeah. was, oh, like i was it was opening up portals to the sacred just like every page and so i just i was like, I, got, I gotta try to talk to this guy um and so i just did some research and found found a found an email address for him and reached out and that was how it that was how it all started and that's how the conversations between him and i and john started and you know yeah those have been just wonderful experience because i just sort of sit there you know and i get to listen and watch them <laughs> what i what i do you know you because you brought this up at the beginning of the conversation like i love being in those conversations and just listening because i i get to just not worry about trying to put into words what i'm seeing and i can just watch it yeah and in that sort of synesthesia of ideas, I can just watch them build things and, and play together and sometimes wrestle together. Right. But like, it's just, it's like a beautiful, beautiful, fun experience. Yeah. We all, I think we all experience it the same way. And we're very grateful that you bring all these people together with their busy schedules. And <laughs> I have no idea how you got to have David, Jonathan and John at the same time with <laughs> with some of the schedule yeah. work so so props to you for that yeah. i was yeah, like I, I have trouble getting one person to to schedule with me um in terms of schedule wise and then to do it with three is quite a miracle yeah it was you know it took like six months and we're trying to do it again and it's like you know we'll see we'll, hopefully you know we thought we had something and then it's like no yeah <laughs> well i love the work you do you're doing ken and i'm gonna continue to follow it i'm uh I'm very happy for you for the direction you're going into in life. I hope that you continue to to follow the logos where it leads to follow Christ. And um, thank you so much for your time today. I had a wonderful time talking to you. Yeah, likewise. I I, I really appreciate you, man. And I uh, I look forward to to continuing to follow your work as well. And thank you so much. This this has been a lot of fun. Thank you. Good luck with the rest of your day. It's only seven thirty somehow. <laughs> That's uh, that's right. That's really good. I aspire to be like that someday. <laughs> All right, Ken. Thank you for your time. I'll see you. All right.